want to bring on our first guest in the noon hour, Brian Nick, Nuveen Chief Investment Strategist, joins us right now. Uh, and Brian, as we've been kind of discussing the, the inflation fronts and everything like that, we have seen yields come down uh, on treasuries. I'm curious to get your take on maybe you know the GDP numbers we got this morning and how it all fits into how the Fed might be gauging this. Sure. And I think the Fed really is central to all of this. I think the markets have started to look at the inflation data as well as the growth data through the prism of how the Fed is likely to respond. Uh, and that's interesting because in inflation data itself could have an impact on the markets. If there's runaway inflation, we could see tips break evens, gapping out even wider. We could see inflation trades start to work well again, maybe a weaker dollar. But because inflation is seen as the thing that's going to bring the Fed in, get rid of quantitative easing, eventually tighten policy, when we do get those high inflation surprises, it tends to depress the outlook for growth because investors are, are scared that the Fed is going to come in and commit a policy error or just prematurely tighten and kind of ruin the party again a little bit too early. So that's why you see a flatter yield curve, despite the fact we're seeing higher inflation. Those two things don't really match up if you look at an economics or a finance textbook, but they're happening right now. And I think it's really only when inflation turns over and that source of concern around the Fed maybe goes away or fades a bit that we could see the yield curve steepen a bit again. Inflation, of course, a big overhang in the market. But Brian, we've also seen in recent weeks this concern about the spread of the Delta variant sort of entering um, or, or weighing on trades. And we heard from Jay Powell yesterday sort of said, look, essentially that, that he hasn't seen the type of behavioral change that we saw with the spikes early on in the pandemic, seeming to suggest that people have sort of learned to kind of adapt to uh, these spikes that we've seen more recently. I mean, do you think that concern, a risk, if we can even call it that, has been a bit overdone? I think if you look at last Monday's trading, I think that was a lot about the Delta variant and it reversed pretty quickly. I think I agree with the, the chairman's comments that we are not seeing the same degree of behavioral change in the sort of more recent waves that we did initially. Now, there's two things that can cause uh, COVID-19 to have a direct economic and market impact. One is if consumers voluntarily change their behavior, we're seeing them become more resistant to these latest waves of COVID. They're not doing as much differently than they would normally. We're not seeing any changes to mobility. We're not seeing many changes to consumer spending, spending patterns on services versus on goods. And the other way is that governments can step in and actually try to mitigate the spread by doing economic uh, restrictions. And, and that is also less likely to happen here in the U.S., I think at either a state or a federal level than perhaps in other countries that have been locked down sort of in and out uh, during the last 18 months or have stayed that way. I'm thinking countries like Australia, uh, but lately you've seen countries, in, especially in Asia and other emerging markets that have tried to restrict movement to restrict the spread, and that will harm economic activity. So what we think that the upshot is here for Delta is probably slows down what we thought was going to be a sequential global recovery starting in the U.S., moving to Europe, eventually getting to Asia and EM, probably delays that, that handoff a bit going to Europe and I think more likely to Asia if we start to see more problems and more kind of lockdowns or other restrictions in those countries that have not yet gotten significant portions of their population vaccinated. Yeah, and then, I mean, I guess, Brian, the other thing, we, we didn't get any uh, substantial changes here in terms of policy from the Fed decision. No one was really expecting that, but we did uh, get a little bit more clues into uh, kind of when the Fed is expecting to start to taper its asset purchases. And when you look at that, you have about a, a timeline of November or December for when we might hear uh, a change in policy and eventually coming in Q1 when that kicks off in 2022. I mean, uh, what are the expectations for you about how the market might react to that uh, once the Fed does actually indicate it's going to happen. Yeah, I think we're pretty close to consensus. I think the, the Fed's not really hiding the fact now that they're moving toward a taper. I think seeing anything in 2021 would be a big hawkish surprise. And I think the Fed wants to avoid that. But we will see sort of the Fed continuing to hold the market's hand at Jackson Hole at the September meeting, and then probably announce something more concretely in November or December to start tapering in the first quarter of next year and then be done with quantitative easing by the end of 2022. And then they can turn their attention to increasing interest rates. Uh, I think the Fed learned its lesson from 2013. There was a more abrupt announcement of the first round of quantitative easing after the financial crisis. The 10-year yield doubled uh, in a relatively short period of time. It eventually did come back down, but there was sort of this needless economic and market volatility. The Fed, I think, has learned how to avoid through very gradual changes to the messaging and a lot of handholding for the markets as they get ready to wind down this emergency liquidity provision. 